In these Masters of the Air clips, we see B-17 upper turret stations engaging in air-to-air -air combat. The gunner is defending the bomber from German bomber interceptors. The intent of this video is to fact-check the series' top turrets, equipment, features, and usage. We will identify seven questionable upper turret issues in the series' battle clips. The upper turret is but one of the nine B-17F model gun stations. The bomber's flight engineer operates the top turret. As a flight engineer, he works closely with the pilot and co-pilot, checking engine and systems operations, fuel management, and will be called upon to troubleshoot any plane malfunctions. Computing sighted power turrets have advantages over flexible mounted guns. Power turrets reduce the effort required in gun manipulation in a slipstream, and computing gun sights increase both range and accuracy. Computing gun sights eliminate target guesswork by accounting for the bullet's drop, lead, drift, and aircraft speed differentials in both the vertical and horizontal directions, as shown on this graphic from a declassified 1944 U.S. Navy training course document titled Aircraft Fire Control. The gunner tracks the enemy aircraft with the gun sight reticle and when within range depresses the gun's triggers. The bullets will follow this path, striking the target here. This page from a 1944 B-17G field service manual outlines characteristics of the Sperry upper turret. The turret is located just behind the pilot and co-pilot stations. The turrets are armed with two Browning M2 50 caliber machine guns. The K-3 computing gun sight accounts for bullet ballistics. The turret's azimuth travel is 360 degrees and elevation travel is from 0 to 85 degrees. The turret's movement is controlled by a self-contained electrohydraulic motor unit. The system does not tap into the plane's hydraulic system. Turret movement is controlled by a hand controller unit. The turret costs $7,185, as discussed in this Army Air Force's historical studies document titled Development of Aircraft Gun Turrets in the AAF. The K-3 gun sight costs $2,250. Each gun is fed by 400 link cartridges, as shown on this table from a 1945 AAF Air Technical Services document titled Tactical Planning. Each gun's rate of fire is up to 14 rounds per second, as defined in this 1944 AAF Gunnery School Manual. This implies a turret's duration of fire is around 29 seconds. The ammo mix is varied from a repeating belt of one tracer for every four armor piercing rounds, to two armor piercing, two incendiary, and one tracer, to 100% armor piercing incendiary by the start of 1944. Bomber ammo loadouts and timelines were covered in the channels, tracer and flexible mount gunnery video highlighted, located in the channel's Masters of the Air playlist. Additional characteristics of the turret are shown on this page from a 1944 Army Air Forces Material Command document titled Index of Army Aeronautical Equipment, Volume 5, Armament. The K-3 gun sight moves with the guns. The guns are charged with overhead handles. The turret weight equates to 650 pounds. To chamber a cartridge, the gunner will pull on each of the charging handles twice. Don't ride the cables back. Let them snap. The turret's maximum azimuth angular speed equates to 40 degrees per second. The guns incorporated a cutoff feature to keep from firing at your own bomber's vertical stabilizer or propellers, as discussed in this 1944 Army Air Forces document titled Handbook of Operations and Servicing Instructions for the Upper Deck Turrets. The turret's hand control unit and K3 gun sight features and usage can be best explained by a walkthrough of this desktop show-and-tell homemade display. The turret is controlled by movement of the handles in both azimuth and elevation. The more handle deflection, the faster the turret rotation, up to 40 degrees per second. The left handle has a dead man lever. The turret circuit will be broken unless this lever is depressed. This is a safety feature. His left hand's thumb operates the push-to-talk comms microphone. Either trigger activates both machine guns. The right handle contains the trigger and the target range grip. The range grip operates like a motorcycle throttle. It is used for adjusting the target framing reticle lines. The gunner needs to frame the wingtips of the enemy plane. While looking through the gun sight's optic head, the gunner will be framing the interceptor's wingtips with the illuminated vertical reticle lines. He controls the distance between the vertical lines by rotating the range grip. This image shows a gun sight's under-ranging, over-ranging, and correct ranging. To use the turret, the gunner first powers up the turret by flipping on the main power switch located in the junction box. The turret's junction box is to the left of the gunner station. Next, turn on the K3 gun sight. Adjust the illuminated reticle's brightness. 
Prior to reaching enemy territory, test fire your guns. Always test one at a time by alternating the right-left gun solenoid power switches. If an FW-190 is spotted, you will need to know its wingspan. Characteristics and geometry of the FW-190 are shown on this page from a 1943 Air Force's training manual titled, Get That Fighter. The 34.5 foot wingspan is input into the K3 gun sight by rotating the target dial. Adjust the K3's optic head polarized sky filter. This feature is required for interceptors attacking from out of the sun. Track the interceptor with the turret's gun sight by looking through its optic head. You will see an illuminated horizontal line and two vertical lines. Continually frame the plane's wingtips with the reticle's vertical lines. Now the compensating gun sight has the range data needed to solve a ballistic solution. Fire on the interceptors using short bursts when within a 1,000 yard range. Interceptors distance can be found by the range gauge where the units are per 100 yards. If the plane is within 200 yards, deploy the iron sight for point blank firing. A turret slot shutter strap is needed to keep the outside air from flowing into the turret. Like seen on this image from a 1943 Sperry powered operating gun turret operations and maintenance manual. The shutters are shown in this image. Without these shutters, the gun's vertical track opening will act as a ram air scoop, bringing minus 50 degree Fahrenheit air into the turret at the bomber's true air speed of around 220 miles per hour. The flexible thin shutter strips slide along the turret's framing rails, as shaded here. The upper shutter was constructed out of plexiglass and in later models metal. This image shows the shutter strip and gun's collar connection bracket. Without this feature, the turret's gunner would likely get injured by frostbite on his unprotected face. These are the features I would expect to see. Charging handles and cable pulling system. K3's optic head. Bead sight stowed. Sky filter. No barrel muzzle sight post. Turret slot shutters. Also, the turret's rotation speed should not exceed 40 degrees per second, and tracers should not be used on episode 7 and on. Let's take a look at the series upper turret 7 discrepancies found ranked in order from significant to nitpicky. Item 1. Turret's rotational tracking speed is too fast. The turret's rotational speed in the clip equates to 80 degrees per second. The speed of the turret in the clip is twice the maximum turret speed. The clip has been slowed down by a factor of 2 for reference. This clip shows a real turret's rotational speed of around 40 degrees per second. Item 2. The muzzles were fitted with sight posts. None of the turret barrels were ever fitted with sight posts. This is like seeing a Sherman tank with a sight post on its barrel. Funny thing is, the non-CGI models did not have sight posts. Item number three, none of the turrets are equipped with slot shutters. This can be ascertained by these clips and clip freeze frames. The gunner is also not wearing his goggle in some of these scenes. There is no way he could perform any tasks with a 200 mile per hour minus 50 degree Fahrenheit slipstream air migrating into the turret cavity. Consider the effects that a high speed cold wind air would have on your vision. Item number four, no K3 sight head illuminated reticle lines. Since the camera is panning from the gunner's view, I would have expected to see the illuminated reticle horizontal and vertical lines. The CGI team could have easily added the sight head illumination lines framing the interceptor's wingspan centered in the sight window. Item number five, no tracer should be used in episode seven and on. Tracer usage is correct for the episodes one through six time period. They were eliminated at the end of 1943. They are shown in episode seven, the March 1944 mission to Berlin. Bomber gunner ammo belt loadouts were 100% armor piercing incendiary by March of 1944 no tracers. Item number six, no charging handle cables. The turret gun racking charging handles are not connected to anything. An accurate pulley system could have been rigged with minimal effort. Item number seven, no K3 gun sight sky filter in any of the clips. This would be a critical issue in maintaining visibility from attacks that come from the sun. Did you agree with the items listed as discrepant significant enough to point out? Any one of these items could have been addressed during the shooting with minimal effort, had they desired. If you have enjoyed this deep dive fact check review, please consider liking and or commenting on the video.